Clerk will call the roll. Lynn Whitley, County Judge. Here. Roy Charles Brooks, Mr. Precinct 1. Present. Devin Allen, Mr. Precinct 2. Here. Gary Finkus, Mr. Precinct 3. J. Around J. here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, he'll be back in a minute. J.D. Johnson, Commissioner of Precinct 4. Here. Constitution. Thank you. Our invocation today will be delivered by our own Robert Carter. Uh, after the invocation, please remain standing for our pledges. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Morning, Rob. Good morning. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you for this day. For we know that this very moment was not promised to us. We are grateful for life, health, and strength that allowed us to be here today. We invoke your presence into this room, asking that you would bless everyone under the sound of my voice, that you would guide the proceedings of this court in a peaceful and productive manner. Allow this body to function as a solid example of we the people. Give birth to systems and solutions that we can use throughout this nation. And in critical times like this, a time that has brought people to their knees saying, I can't, I can't make it, I can't do it, I can't deal with it, I can't deal with COVID, politics, this election, any of this. However, your word clearly states that we can do all things through Christ that strengthens yes, us. Yes. From my house to the White House, allow us to stand on the promises of your word, yes. knowing that you love us in spite of what it looks like. We activate our faith knowing that we will come to a place of overcoming. We proclaim victory by faith that either naturally or supernaturally, you will resolve all of these issues. Yes. And as a final thought, what is, as a city, a county, even as a nation, even the world in general, we would turn our faces to the wall, push back our plates, and seek your face until revelation comes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hey. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Robert, thank you for that very strong prayer this morning. Members of court, as it relates to the agenda this morning, we're going to take several items out of order. Um, before we get to the point, uh, before the consent agenda, uh, after we do the approval of the minutes, I'm going to ask Hyder Garcia, our elections administrator, to come up and talk to the court a little bit about items impacted by COVID and um, in issues dealing with elections that will that's on our agenda under a one under the administrator's office so um, and then we'll have other changes in the agenda also but but and finally at 10 30 this morning we are going to recess for 30 minutes and then we will reconvene at approximately 11 o'clock thank you court members you have before you the minutes of our regular meeting of october the 20th as well as a special call meeting uh, that same afternoon of October the 20th. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. Commissioner Figgis, you need to turn your light on. And then Commissioner Allen? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, you have before you the consent uh, agenda. Your Honor, before we go into the consent agenda, I would like to ask that we bring, we move first to the administrator section We'll pick up the consent agenda after that, simply because we may have an audience participation form on one of the consent items. Okay. And All right. And so with that, uh, members of the court, if we could go to the county administrator section, item 7A1. This concerns the discussion of activities associated with the impact of the coronavirus on uh, Tarrant <laughs> County. And I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Garcia to come forward and to address the court uh, on on the uh, on how it's impacted elections and other issues dealing with elections good morning your good honor morning, of the court um, so we're talking about the impact of covid on elections i um obviously you're all aware i think at this point we've had um, every week one site has had to close down for a period of close to 24 hours uh first week 
if I recall well, it was Brookside. This week it was Cuomo, and before that it was, sorry, the first week was Keller Town Hall. The second week we had the Brookside Community Center, and this, yesterday we had the JP as Cuomo Clinic. Those closures have been for a day. We've been able to get crews back up and running the next day. Um, looks like everything's working in terms of the protocols, because every time we've had one case of one poll worker, we have not seen it spread through the rest of the crew. So that's, that's fantastic. So uh, yes, we'll keep asking our clerks to wear their masks and stay safe out there. I uh, want to thank you for your quick action in getting the Como, the Viola Pitts Clinic at JPS early voting site back open this morning. That is a critical high volume site and uh, to turn it around that quickly <coughs> says a lot about the efficiency of your office and Thank your attention to uh, the sensitivities of voting in every community. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. And yeah, it's been the case with all three. Um, we've literally taken staff off our office and sent them in the next day to keep it running and then replace them. And But we appreciate it, and I'll pass that on to the staff because they've, they've really um, gone for that. Um, other than that, we have another issue that we need to just make sure that everybody's aware of. We have been receiving mail ballots. Um, the ballot board has been processing the signatures and cutting them, opening them, and extracting them. And as they've been scanned and imaged to get ready for counting after early voting, we started noticing about a third of them were being rejected by the scanners when they're imaged. Um, what we believe at this point is that the print shop that did these ballots for us um, basically can improve the quality of the printing because those barcodes are not 100% legible 100% of the times to the scanner. So what's happening is we scan the ballots in and the scanner says, I don't identify these documents. I can't see the barcodes. And when the scanner doesn't see the barcode, it might as well have been a newspaper that you scanned. It's just not a ballot. So we're having to separate those and have the ballot board uh, go through the same process we do with, for example, overseas ballots, right? So overseas people, they, may, they have a choice to get their ballot via email, but they print it in a home printer on desktop paper. Uh, and so when it gets there, the ballot board has to take that and uh, basically copy that into an official ballot on official paper. And so that process is outlined in the law. It's also used, for example, if someone's, I always say, having breakfast and damages their ballot and mails it in, their vote is there, uh, and that process is defined to protect the integrity of the ballot, and the ballot board members of both parties sit down and they copy from this to a blank copy so that it can be scanned and counted in a, the automated, certified by the state system. So basically what this is, is just, we're going to have to keep scanning those ballots, uh, let the certified system again say, can't read these, and then the ballot board is going to replicate those to clean copies so they can be counted. That is the process outlined in the law. Um, it's certainly a lot more volume than we expected. Usually the board has to make hundreds of remakes. We're talking about probably tens of thousands if the rate stays this way. But our goal here is to, again, make sure we don't improvise, but protect the integrity of the ballot and follow the process outlined in the law, which is to use the remake to correct defective ballots that cannot be counted in the automated way. Um, so that's going to increase our time at the office and the ballot. Um, we believe we have enough time and resources to do this in the time frame we have, but I just wanted to make the court, the court aware uh, of the situation and if I don't, know, it's, I don't know if it's 100% COVID related, but if you have questions right now is the time to ask me. Yes, sir. Thank you for bringing that <coughs> situation to our attention this morning, Hyder. <coughs> and uh, I appreciate the fact that there are remedies that are provided for in the election code and that you are committed to using those remedies to make sure that every vote is counted. 
I also recognize that there are some in the leadership of this country who are determined to make an issue of any problems with mail-in ballots. That's why it is critical that you, number one, follow the law, and number two, get every one of those votes counted. Any solution to this problem that does not result in having every one of those votes counted is unacceptable. It is not the voters' fault that we hired a vendor that did substandard work. That's correct. The persons who voted on those ballots voted in good faith. That's correct. And they deserve to have their votes counted. And I demand on their behalf that their votes be counted. Any other solution is unacceptable. And there is no other option. That's, you're right. Uh, there is no other option. And again, this is not a situation that is first time uncommon or unknown, not just to our office or to counties in Texas. This is a standard problem nationwide that is regulated by processes anywhere you go. And it's remaking a defective ballot into a readable ballot to make it counted. So I guess to try to transmit some peace of mind, if I can, um, we're not seeing a problem that has never been seen. We're not improvising a solution that has never been tried. And it's clearly identified in the law, not just what the process is, but who has to do it and how to guarantee the integrity of the ballot. So for what it's worth, it's, it's looking just like a matter of a lot of work, more than we expected, but not unknown, not unfamiliar, not, we don't know what's behind door number two. Well, I appreciate you and your people for going through the extra work to make it happen. Now, if you need additional resources to make this happen, ask. Uh, the county administrator's office has certainly already made that offer, and we will to ask through their office for any requests that we have for that. In fact, we have to, we've, we've sent uh, some additional personnel uh, out to elections this morning, and that was a request that was made yesterday evening. And uh, we may have to ask some other departments, depending on what the workload issue is, but Hyder and I are working very closely on this. Okay, let me. Okay, I missed part of that. Did you say that there had already been a request for additional staff? There was a request last night for uh, I think two additional staff initially, and what it was was to do some of the menial tasks that so that we could take the, do those while the more experienced elections people could be shifted over to other activities, and uh, I think we sent five people out this morning. That's correct. To be trained. And, um, and we, we've made it very clear to Hyder and, and the Elections Department that if they need any additional resources, we're standing ready to bring those resources to the table to make sure we, uh, we complete the task that Hyder is sitting out on. Okay. I did have a few more questions. So I'd like to make sure I understand how many ballots were affected, ones that we've received, and then are there more ballots out there that we can anticipate being returned where this would be an issue? So we, we've we done about 2,000 through the scanner, and I think the rate was about a third were being rejected. So that rate could sustain or it could decrease. Um, obviously, the vendor who did the print job is pending to give us some information. They might have split this. We really need to get this mic out of here. They might have split this into two different printers or run it all through the same. So those variables may tell us this rate will sustain or may decrease. When we have that information, we'll share it. Um, so if we have close to 60,000 return out and the rate is a third, then we're going to have 20,000 remakes to do. Okay, Looks so like when it. should we um, expect to receive an update from the vendor? 
Excuse me? When would we receive an update from the vendor? I, I hope to get one today. Okay. So then what's important for um, voters who are participating by mail at this point, if they have their ballot and they hear about this and they are confused as to what they should do with their ballot? What mail it in or suggest? return it. Mail it in or return okay. it. Every ballot that is handmarked has clearly expressed on it the voter's intent. And I will not tell someone just because I don't want to spend an extra hour in their office that they have to go vote in person if they don't want to. If they choose that they want to return their vote by mail, they can mail it back, they can drop it off. We will work with the ballot board to solve the problem we have. That's not on them. So they can either mail it back, return it in the drive through or go vote in person, whatever they feel better doing. But if they decide to take their mail ballot and not use it and go to the either an early voting site or an election day site to vote in person, they need to bring that early vote ballot with them Correct. and have it canceled at the polling site, and then they can vote in person. Correct. Correct. They will just receive it and give them a regular ballot. It's called a surrender, uh, and they have no nothing else to worry about after that. They vote it immediately right there. Commissioner Allen, did you have any other questions? Yeah, I've gone about this. Thank you. Okay, let me let me just make a couple of things, uh, or uh, things I want to highlight. We indicated that we've sent some folks out there. Um, understand that the process by which those ballots, those mail-in ballots, are um, first agree, you know, certified, or they've gone through the signature verification process. That's all being done by something called a ballot board, and the members of that ballot board are determined by uh, the parties. Give us lists of names. Those lists of names are approved by the election board, and um, those are the folks who are working to, first off, take the mail-in ballot, do the signature verification, determine that that agrees, uh, open the ballot, open the carrier envelope, and then ultimately to count that ballot. Um, our people that we're sending out there are helping maybe to do those things outside that other experienced employees are doing so that those experienced employees can be helping the ballot board committee. That ballot board committee is, the chair of it is determined by which party won that county in the last general election. And in this case, it's a Republican. So you have Kelly Roberson, who is the chairman of the ballot board. You have Cat, what's Cat's last name? Cano. Cat Cano. Take them. Cat Cano. Okay. Cat is the vice chair. She is a Democrat. And then Renee Perez, Perez. is the Libertarian. So uh, they take, and there's about probably 30 or so more Republicans, as well as 40 something Democrats, as well as, you know, five or six Libertarians. And so all those folks are working on that ballot board. Um, May, may, I, may I add something to yeah. that? I know we have those 80 names, um, but part of the processes that we have to make sure everybody has peace of mind and we protect the integrity of the ballot is we work in a room that is confined and say, securely locked. So we want to keep it that way. We don't want to rush through this and say, well, you know, if we bring half of those down to the admin building, there's an empty room we can use. We want to stick to the processes we have in place and not say, you know, and I'm only saying this because the room has a limited capacity, and even though we have 80 names, they're coming in in groups of 20, the, 25 at a time. We're extending the shifts, but we want to stick to the size of that room. The integrity of the ballot is the number one priority, and there's been a lot of yes, restrictions sir. placed on who has access to that room. That's right. And so that's very important. As of last night, about 60,000 of the 85,000 mail-in ballots had been returned. Um, of that 60,000, they, they have already gone through the initial stage of the verification process. Of that approximately 60,000, 
1950 are still awaiting a decision by the entire board as to whether they feel like the, the signatures match. Out of the 60,000, 22 have been rejected to this point. So that means the vast majority have already uh, been verified that the signatures match and they'll be ready to go through that process. Again, the three folks along with Hyder and some of and his assistants worked through the weekend to determine the process that they felt most comfortable with. Top priority, integrity of the ballot. That's correct. Yes, they want to have the count done by the close of the polls on Tuesday evening. Top priority, integrity of the ballot. Yes, sir. Uh, and so they are working very well together. These are folks who've been involved in elections for many years. Um, they, again, they've developed the plan and they trust each other and they work together with each other. And so I feel very good about the process that they've set up and that they have in place and are in the process of carrying out. May I add something? Um, just to avoid any distortion of, you know, the top priority is integrity of the ballot. We believe we'll get everything in, but I want everybody to understand if we have 60,000 ballots and two thirds are being accepted, that means 40,000 ballots at least, plus everything we remake and duplicate, the board does, is going to be posted on election night. And I'm only saying this because I don't want this to be somehow morphed into, we may not have elections on the 550 something thousand plus whatever is cast this week are going to be there at 7 p.m. when we post. The 40,000 at this rate that will be automatically accepted by the scanner and don't need remake will be post. And out of the 20,000, we expect the majority of those to be posted at 7 p.m. election day. So just seven -ish. wanted to clarify that. Seven ish. Seven ish. Just wanted to clarify that in case, you know, one sentence from one somebody and the other ends up being we may not have results at seven. No, that's not. A question at all. Hida, we're counting on you. Well, their their group is doing very good work, and I want to. I mean, they have, you know, between COVID and everything else that's going on, they are doing excellent work. Uh, the one other thing I want to mention is the vendor was a state authorized vendor. Yeah. In this deal, so we just didn't go out and select a, a printer off the streets. This was a state authorized vendor. Um, and again, thank you and thank all your folks who are doing such a great job on this deal. Between COVID and everything else that's going on, we very much appreciate the work y'all are doing. And, and just absolutely. Friday, You're performing miracles every day. We're trying. Okay. We're trying. And I want to acknowledge the, the ballot board members. They, they have been solid, you know, uh, partner on this and they work incredibly well together and that's made all of this just flow better because they are as focused on the integrity of the ballot as we are and that just makes everything be amazing. Matt, we're going to recess for about three minutes. We have come a long way and, and um, I'm surprised GK hasn't set the three minute timer on me so I will move as quickly as, as I can. Um, I can do that. <laughs> so uh, uh, set I have a, the three minute clock in your head. Yeah, I will do the best that I can. Go ahead. Uh, I oh there it is. Okay, on the side. I just need to know where to look. All right. So um, I just want to remind you what the purpose of magistration is basically about. Is our goal of our magistrates is to do individual determination, renew, re, uh, review the nature and the circumstances of the of the offense see if the person can comply, be able to comply with bail restrictions, and consider the public safety and the safety of the alleged victim. And that's what the magistrates are trying to get to and do individual consideration. Um, and it's important that you kind of lay out goals of what you're trying to do because you, know, you can't achieve all your goals, but if you don't have an end point to point to, you're not going to get there. And you know, we're, our goal in Tarrant County, if the judges are to ado adopt the best pretrial practices try to see defendants within 24 hours of arrest. Uh, statutorily, we have up to 48, but studies have shown that the longer a defendant remains in jail, the more likely are they to commit a criminal act. So the sooner we can get people in front and start addressing the situation that put them in front of a magistrate, the better served that individual is, but also our, uh, our, society, our society and the community as a whole. 
We want to strive to interview every defendant, uh, their financial status and so forth prior to magistration so we can determine their ability or how they, the magistrate can determine how, how the impact of them to be able to afford bond. We want to take, we have limited resources. GK continually reminds me of such. Uh, and we want to make sure that we have a limited amount of, that the people that we are supervising, that we tailor it to people that need to be supervised and we're not over supervising people that need to be supervised. Um, we also want to identify with people with mental health issues as early as on in the system as possible and get them out of the system, get them to treatment and work in those type of capacity. Um, we want to ensure that the bond conditions hope, uphold public safety and they can be enforced. That's an important factor. You just, you, don't, you, know, you just can't set bond restrictions on person. You want to make sure that they can be enforced. Um, we want to uh, allocate these resources to those individuals. We want to strive to have low risk, economically challenge people that the reason they're in jail is not because of their economic situation. So that we want to consider that. And at the same point in time, the coin flip of, mag of magistration is just because you're economically advantaged, you could be a risk for the public and that should be also considered by the magistrate. Uh, and ultimately, we want to ensure the presumption of innocence in the pride. I mean, it kind of, that's kind of the goals we're achieving. So shooting for. So as you all are aware, I mean, we started using the static risk assessment uh, uh, from Washington State in November of 2017. We are in the process of implementing the public safety assessment, which is, is often referred to as the gold standard of risk assessments. That's a much more cumbersome process. Uh, we, uh, the judges and stakeholder committee are having all those meetings. So we are moving forward on that. Um, 2008, January of 2018, the sheriff's department uh, started accepting people into jail, and and so that became where we really started with central magistration. It was all on paper. I've given presentations before about how we move paper to electronic, and and then we started adding additional magistration sessions, um, it, in and not to ensure that people can get in, in front of a magistrate as soon as possible. And it was last year that we added a 1 a.m. magistration here, and just this past July in, in Arlington, which I'll touch on a little bit deeper later, is we actually video magistrating remotely in Arlington. And I'll remind everybody that the whole purpose of, of magistration is to get somebody in front of a, uh, a judge sooner than later. And there's some, there's some advantages to the county that GK reminds me of constantly, but but that's the goal of the judge is to actually see somebody and expedite due process. Um, so kind of where we stand today, we are a 24 hour, seven day week operation and we should be, we sent out our last uh, two job offers to the fill, fully fill all the positions that we were funded. We want to acknowledge to the court that we committed to GK that we would only fill them as we needed them. So we are finally getting to that point. So there were some cost savings. We have 14 magistration sessions a day so that there's lots of opportunity to go through and that includes in the correction center, out at JPS, out at Green BA and Arlington. And we've also mastered, thanks to Zoom and other ways, these one-off magistrations of people in hospitals that we don't have this capacity. So we're actually, you know, the pandemic has put some challenges in front of us, but also said, hey, if we can Zoom things here, we can Zoom things everywhere. And so that's actually been kind of a neat process. Uh, one of the other things that was important to the courts is that every proceeding in court is public. So all these video magistrations are actually being broadcast at the bond desk and even Arlington is being broadcast at the bond desk and in Arlington. So they're not secret proceedings held in some room where nobody can get to. They're actually watching it. And, and it's, it's, it's rather interesting. The, uh, and so that makes it very, you know, again, trying to be open and honest to what's going on. Uh, the magistrate activity kind of give you a nutshell. There are still outlying agencies that are still uh, uh, setting their own bonds. That's they have the statutory authority, but we're up to 92% of all unfiled cases are supervised by magistrate. Um, we're seeing even during the pandemic about 89 defendants a day, over 149 charges, and kind of showing you where we are. I put a little chart on there. How many bonds are out there, and it's important to note that there were one time we were doing more personal bonds but because of the we have been kind of hamstrung by the governor's order about how to utilize bonds and so they've decreased but I will assure you that the, the magistrates take everybody in individual consideration when they look at that 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 so um, 
Our long range plan is we want to expand uh, video magistration to more remote sites. Uh, they, uh, that we are actually in con contact with Keller and Hearst as we speak. Hearst is kind of, we actually, Hearst was supposed to be our pilot back in 2016. So I'm, we're really pleased that we're getting them on board and we're ongoing discussions at North Richland Hills. We are attempting to hit the larger regional jails because that will have a greater impact, but that's not going to slow us down. Anybody else, other small agencies have reached out to us. DFW Airport, which is a which is be, the magistrates have requested we do those because there's lots of issues at the airport that can be resolved if they can get in front of a magistrate. Also, uh, Forest Hills reached out to us and we are working with um, uh, Judge Lewis. And if he's watching, I, I, I told him I'd me mention this. So he's aware. I, I can assure you he's probably watching. <laughs> so either way, but I wanted to make sure that, but we're working, we're working with them. And so I kind of want to touch on Arlington video magistration. Uh, and main, you know, and a lot of people have got this place going, and 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 I get to stand up and 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 I want to let the people let people know, and this may be shocking, but there's some very high uh, Dana Jackson in IT, CJ Young in IT, they did yeoman's work to make this happen. Barbara Murphy and Naomi Daniels in my shop did a fantastic work to make this all happen in process. And also Lieutenant Moses and Chief Lowry out in Arlington that, you know, that we worked with us and all the magistrates, it was really collabor co co collaborative effort and it worked very well. And so I want to acknowledge that, but we've shortened the time of defendants to see people in Arlington. They used to have to spend a day in jail in Arlington and been transported. Now we see them four times a day in Arlington. Um, so there's not a delay in transport. And so what's important to the judges is that due process is the next expedited. But what's important to the commissioners who spend a tremendous amount of money on other departments besides uh, criminal courts is that it has an impact on the jail population. Arlington Jail and Arlington PD did their own briefing in front of commissioners, their, their council and reported that they have, their, in, their jail has reduced by 50%. So these people are bonding out in Arlington and not being transported to, to Tarrant County. So, and Arlington has become such a model and they want to continue to work with us and this is what they reported to their city council so that we can just replicate what we're doing there. So it's very handy. So. Uh, our future goals are uh, we want to magistrate at least 33% of all defendants uh, outside of the Tarrant County Jail. If we can do that, that's fantastic. We want to fully implement the public safety assessment because it has a presumption of release. So we hopefully can get more people out of jail under the tailored bond condition. And I want to give a kind of a thanks to the sheriff in the beginning of the pandemic. They reached out to us and asked about site and release. The courts did not have the infrastructure to do site and release. We do now. It's not the it's not the decision of the courts whether we do site and release. That's up to the executive branch. But we want the court to know that if any police agency out there wants to do site and release, we have the capacity to do that. We've come up with a system, and so those issues. And that's something that's been on the law since 2008. This is not cutting edge. This is some we just you know we never addressed it, and central magistration kind of led to that. But we'll defer to this. You know we can do it. So that's all I had. I apologize, Commissioner, because I probably went over three minutes, but I went as quickly as I could. <laughs> You've done a good job, sir, and I thank you, Greg. Um, let me comment that uh, central magistration is an issue that I had pushed for a number of years. The uh, philosophy was that with public safety and uh, a reasonable guarantee that a person would appear at court, that person should not be languishing in our jails simply because they were too poor to write a check to get out of jail. So central magistration was a part of that effort to make sure that persons had an ability to get out of jail regardless of their ability to pay. Judge Whitley then brought central magistration to the table and it proved to be a vital cog 
in this whole wheel of ensuring equal justice under the law for every citizen who finds themselves a, a candidate for residency in our county jail. Uh, I applaud you and your staff and the judges with whom and for whom you work for adopting these uh, programs and making them work. Thank uh, you, sir. I would ask, are there any comments or questions from members of the court? No, I mean... Yeah, I, I would... Thank you, Commissioner Brooks. Oh. Sorry, Commissioner Fickus, go ahead. Okay. I know that, you know, this is, we have been discussing this, I guess, for three years or so. And um, I know a number of other counties in the state have had quite a, quite a journey. And it seems that our journey has been a little smoother um, than maybe some of the others. For that, I want to, I want to, Thank you guys for that. That's our objective. Um, so it, it seems to be working to some extent. So. Commissioner Allen. Yes. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Brooks. Um, Greg, I appreciate the update and would echo what's been said. Um, obviously, I know there's been a, a lot of work by a lot of people to get us to this point. Uh, one question I have for you is regarding the Arlington magistration is you had mentioned the update to the Arlington City Council approximately when was that? It was I want to say it was in September. I can get you the the report that they I pulled it off of their website. Okay, that would be great. Um, and then also and I realize that this may be a loaded question, but even with the progress that we've made, what's next? The implementation of the public safety assessment is the real key the continuing change of the culture of the presumption of release there's a, you know you have a long as judge Wynn, one of our magistrates we have a lot she tells me we have a lot to untangle after for after custom and understanding what the actual purpose of a bond is and not that it's punitive but it's somebody to get them to show up to court and just that organizational change and community change and the, the purpose of a bond of to assure uh, assure attendance to court I mean that is really the biggest change and as we move forward with the PSA we will be we, we hope that the that that through tailored uh, bond conditions more individuals will be released from jail and sooner but that is and that's the big change and it's the understanding as as these things change is that that it's it is a change of culture uh, you know, I've been part of the Tarrant County criminal justice culture since not about 1993 as a, and, and so it's just this is different and it is and in three years you're not changing you're, we are not changing minds in three years it's good that is what's in front of us is continuing to change minds very good thank you appreciate y'all's time thank you Greg. Okay. So, court members, we're going to move around the agenda somewhat, um, and so we're going to go back to the administrator section, and we're going to go to 7A3. This concerns hospital revenue bonds. Ms. McMillan is here to address the court. Ms. McMillan. Good morning, Judge. Oh, excuse me. Commissioners. Um, we are asking for the court's approval of the issuance of series 2020 hospital <coughs> revenue bonds issued by the Tarrant County Cultural Education Facilities Finance Corporation for Hendrick Medical Center in amount not to exceed $350 million. These bonds will be used to refinance um, previously issued debt that was incurred by Hendrick Medical Center for the um, operation and, and uh, acquisition of their Abilene Regional, Regional Medical Center and Brownwood Regional Medical Center facilities, and also to refund previously issued 2013 Tarrant County Cultural <coughs> Education Facilities Finance Bonds. Um, Hendrick Medical Center is located in Abilene and has served the people of that area since 1924. 
the HUD letter has been provided and they do not have any locations here in Tarrant County. These are taxable bonds, so the um, public hearings were not necessary for these bonds. So we're asking then today that the court just approve the issuance by the Tarrant County Cultural Education Facilities Finance Corporation. A move of approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the bonds. Please vote. Uh, please note that Judge Whitley is not present. Uh, Commissioner Allen. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. The motion passes. Thank you. Members of the court, if we can go to item number two under the administrator section. Uh, just a comment, we have audience participations for item number one, so we're going to hold that until we get a full court in, but we can do item number two. On item number two, we're requesting that the commissioner's court approve agreements with Arlington Life Shelter, Family Pathfinders of Tarrant County, Metroport Meals on Wheels, Mission Metroplex, and Trinity Habitat for Humanity for the distribution of CARES Act Coronas Relief Funds as part of the non-governmental assistance program. Move for approval. I move, oh, go ahead. Somebody else is moving. Second. 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 We have a motion second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, if we now can go to um, human resources, we'll go through the agenda, then come back to item number one on our section. So we're asking the court to receive and file the personnel agenda. So move. Second. We have a motion to second to receive and file the personnel agenda. Please vote. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. We are now going to public health and we'll deal with all six of those issues, or actually the first three. I will uh, mention that on item number two, Your Honor, the Vault Medical Services Agreement, that we do have one audience participation form on that. Mr. Chenaid. <coughs> Good morning, Your Honor, and members of the court. Good morning, um, Benny. We have three items uh, before you for consideration this morning. Item number one under public health is a request for approval of a memorandum of understanding with the city of Burleson for access to the Tarrant County Public Health COVID database. As you may recall, they've uh, now got a local health authority, Dr. Martin. So this setup is very similar to what we did with Arlington, giving them access to our COVID-19 database so they can, uh, you know, have a I guess a leg up on contact tracing efforts within their community. Move approval. Second. With the observation that uh, about a third of the city of Burleson is actually in Tarrant County. That much, huh? Mm -hmm. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, second item for your consideration is a request for approval of a research agreement between Tarrant County and Vault Medical Services <laughs> on behalf of Tarrant County Public Health. So Vault's the uh, medical management company that uh, has been helping us run our uh, saliva testing locations. The testing actually goes to the Rutgers University lab. I think they're now, now called IBX, um, and the uh, research agreement is that they're looking to develop new testing technologies. So this would be a voluntary study. Uh, people, uh, Vault will provide a study coordinator on site, and the location staff will be trained um, to educate the public about that this is also a study location. So if they want to enroll, they can voluntarily <laughs> enroll. They will get their regular saliva test, and if they choose to uh, enroll in the study, they would provide what is called a neat saliva without any preservatives and also maybe asked to do a nasal swab. 
and those will go separately. Um, people will still get their results. There's no additional cost. Uh, you know, nothing you know involving uh, the study. It's all approved by the Institutional Review Board, and the idea is that it will help develop new testing technologies. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to second. We do have an audience participation on this particular item. Um, Sherrod Perry. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So yeah, like I said, this uh, this contract is a, a you know deal with testing, uh, the PCR test, and again, uh, you know, many other speakers have have brought this up, but uh, you know, as this the longer this goes on, I learn more and more about this, and you know, recently we have this spike in cases, and it's you know the explanation that's being given. Uh, is that, well, it's because, you know, not enough people are wearing masks, and if more people would wear masks, then this wouldn't be happening. Um, but if you don't understand the test, if you don't really understand this PCR test, there is a lot of deception that can be, that can be uh, you know, done. And <clears throat> one point that I've made is that this test is, has something called cycles. And if you, you know, and, and there is no standard across the world some use 30 cycles, you know, some use 40 cycles. And what a cycle is basically just a doubling, which increases what's in your sample. So the point I'm trying to make is that the more cycles you have, you have a greater chance of getting what we call a false positive. Okay? And what's a false positive? It's basically the idea is that what the test is picking up, it's not picking up, it's not picking up this. <laughs> this, this is like eight pages. Of this is the gene the genome sequence of COVID nineteen, right? It's like well, it like twenty nine thousand base pairs, but the test doesn't look for twenty nine thousand base pairs. So it, it's not looking for that that entire sequence. It's looking for snippets, snippets. Okay, it's like thirty seven. And the reason I'm getting all sciencey is because again, it's not the test is not a gold standard. Okay, this is not a yes no positive. I mean, this test is extremely flawed. Okay, but we, we still push forward with using it as though it is something that is some, that, that it's a test that we should trust and make policy decisions off of. But again, the fact that it's not testing for the entire virus, but just little snippets of it, means that those little snippets could be coming from other things that are not that virus. They could be coming from your, your cells. It could be coming from other viruses. Though it could be detecting... Um, you know, it can be detecting, uh, yeah, other bacteria. There's, I mean, because these samples, when they, when, they, when they test a sample, it's not pure. It's not, it has, they, they basically take a sample from your body which has all kinds of junk in it. So they're picking up, they, that, that test could be picking up something that's not, that's not COVID-19 or that's not coronavirus. And, that's, and many doctors have said this. So, again, when we talk about the spike in cases, I have one question. Has the number of cycles changed? at any point from, I guess, March till now. So whatever test we're using, has the number of cycles been increased recently? That's a question I would have. Because if, if, the, if the number of cycles has increased, then the, then the chance of a false positive increases, which means that you're gonna have more positive, which means you're gonna have more cases. So that's an explanation that I would want. It. That's a question I would have. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other discussion regarding this item? Please vote. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Oh, I did just want to add to Mr. Perry, I know that we're working to schedule a time for you and I to talk, so I do look forward to that, and I appreciate you being here today. Oh, Thank you. Um, so item number three, we're requesting your approval for a contract for services with Ethicus Hospital, DFW LSC, uh, for Tarrant County Public Health Informatics Office. This is for participation in the syndromic surveillance uh, program. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Members of the court, if we could now go ahead and move to uh, the consent agenda. 
Uh, we did not take that up yet because we do have an audience participation form as it relates to two items. They're both under the Criminal District Attorney's Office. It's C1 and 2. This is Mr. Buecher. We'd be standing in the foyer. To Move the approval of the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Okay, uh, Mr. Buecher. I think I have that. Yeah, this is criminal courts administration. Yes, that's criminal courts administration. Oh, criminal courts administration. I'm sorry. Yes, so, sir. I'm Robert B. Before Beaker. you start, yes, let me sir. make sure I clarify this. I was in there. I said criminal district attorney. C one and two is in criminal courts administration. Those are two, those are two professional yes. services contracts with vendors that we use for the various specialty courts. My name is Robert Buecher. And I hope y'all take in consideration of approving these things. As a detention officer and a former <coughs> substance abuse counselor myself, I see the day-to-day -day effects of drugs and what they can do to uh, individuals. What I, what I see day-to-day -day is some people having to support a habit to maintain through this, this COVID because some have lost a lot and all they have left is to do drugs just to get their mind in a state of just staying away from the... Um, from you know reality because this reality is hurting a lot of people and so when I speak to a lot of them I say hey what got you here what puts you here and you know where do you go from here a lot of them say I don't know I don't have family or I have you know missed my kids have gone I have nothing I've lost my business I lost everything divorces happen and uh, some fall into domestic abuse and it's due to drugs so you know some are most of them are first-time offenders I've had um, Mothers come through just stealing meat and food just to feed their their children because they don't have any other way And so, you know a lot of times what they end up doing is they get into drugs because they have no other way And then their kids suffer and the family suffers and you know I talk to vets too We have vets that come through the facility that I work at and I ask them what, what got you there Some of them said I can't escape my mind from the things that I've done overseas or the things that I come back to I don't know how to maneuver through not being relevant because you know as they tell me when you're in a in a um, soldier's position you're relevant you have a job you have a specific duty you know somebody depends on you in one aspect or another and they said when I come back here and I come back to either this COVID mess or I come back in you know I may have got divorced while I was overseas because I've been gone so long you know for six months a year at a time you know depending on how their deployment is <clears throat> You know, and so they get to, they fall into drugs, they get depressed, they come back, and they don't have any kind of anything. You know, so I'm kind of doing one and two together. So, I mean, I hope that y'all approve this because they, they need the help before they, you know, become career criminals or, you know, they make their first mistake into making a long lasting where they have to, you know, keep continuing to recidivism. We don't want that. You know, we want people to be able to be productive members of society, especially for me. You know, I hate seeing people come in, especially first time, you know, parents or anything like that that now have to figure out something for their kids while they're being incarcerated in Tarrant County or Fort Worth City Jail for the short time that they are or could be. So I hope that y'all approve this so we can get them the help and we can start a, get a stopping point before they become, you know, career criminals. We see a lot of people coming through time and time again, the same people, Tevin Barnes, you're back again. You know, you, this certain, this certain person, you're back again. This time it's, it's worse each more time. They're, they're like getting felonies now because now they're habituals. So if we can get ahead of them on that to help them, you know, and help some of these vets too, because I know that's a, a, a one of the bios that you put up was, you know, you, the veteran community, which they really need a lot of help, especially right now. So I just hope that y'all motion to approve this because they need it. And, you, you know, they sacrifice a lot for us. So at least we can do a sacrifice a little bit for them. Thank you. Yes. There's no other discussion. Please vote. Commissioner Allen. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Members of the court, we can now go to uh, County Judge and Commissioner Section Item K1. Hmm. Commissioner Johnson, I believe you have an interlocal agreement. I do. Has this been approved by the DA's office? It has, Commissioner. Move approval of Item 7K1. A and B. Second. second. We have motion to second. Any discussion? Please vote. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Are there any appointments today? There are none. I 
have we already done your item mr Mangus? uh we have not we've done everyone but item number one and i thought what we would do is complete the claims and then go into the briefing and ask uh, uh we need to go ahead and make his presentation and then we'll come back to our item number okay one. then uh do i have a motion to approve the claims including the addendum so second. second we have a motion a second to approve the claims including the addendum uh, so any discussion please vote commissioner allen yes commissioner johnson yes motion passes unanimously briefing items mr manius thank you your honor members of the court we have one additional briefing item this is the uh, the weekly update on on uh, the current and emergency and emerging health issues uh Vinny is here to address the court at this time Thank you. Uh, so just uh, briefly, uh, we're going to update on COVID-19. As you can see, the uh, global case counts continue to rise. Uh, I'm actually kind of hoping that somebody else overtakes us. U.S. continues to maintain the number one lead. Uh, India is catching up, but worldwide cases are 43.4 million, uh, 1.16 million deaths in the U.S., or I mean the world. And then the U.S. case count is 8.7 million and uh, 226,000 deaths. Uh, U.S. did hit a major peak this weekend. Uh, we've surpassed our July numbers. Um, we've had a couple of days that were above 80,000, so certainly not looking good. We're, we're heading into fall, and we're starting to surge quite significantly. Multiple states are involved. Uh, Midwest seems to be the hotbed of activity. North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Illinois, all are putting up a lot of numbers. Um, Texas case counts, we're certainly seeing a trend change in Texas. We're, we're going up 867,000 cases, 17.5 thousand deaths, and 8.5 million tests conducted, out of which 7.8 million are the viral molecular tests that most people want to see, the PCR type. Um, Tarrant County case counts, uh, we're approaching 65,000. I think we're maybe 100, 150 short of 65,000 today. Um, 723 deaths, I think there's four additional deaths to report this morning, and we're approaching 52,000 recoveries. I think we're about maybe 50 short of that. Um, if you look on the right side, the numbers of Tarrant County, according to DSHS data, has 533,000 tests conducted. Uh, seems to have they've cleaned up quite a bit of their information, so this seems to be trending pretty reliably at this point. Uh, they still have this unknown county area where they've got some test parks, so uh, I'm sure we have our share of tests in there as well. But it uh, seems like we're making good progress. U.S. situational awareness, as I was mentioning earlier, if you look at that little uh, red chart on the top with the uh, line, as you can see, a clear uptrend has developed. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to read, but the, the chart where it says new cases, that's this weekend. A couple of days were pretty heavy, and as you can see, We've got a, a peak that's now higher than the July peak. Uh, the charts below, I only snippet uh, the area from Texas, uh, certainly a clear uptrend developing in Texas as well. Here's a more detailed look at what happened in the US, uh, and it just kind of highlights that we've surpassed our peak uh, from July and, and things are not looking good at this point. Texas situation, just wanted to sort of again highlight that, you know, a clear uptrend, even though it's a slow turn, just like what we saw with Tarrant County, it slowly turned and now we're accelerating. I expect that to happen for Texas <coughs> as well. A positivity rate is confirming. Uh, we've certainly, you know, hit a low at 6% and now we're back up to 8.9%. I think recently, about last week, they were at 9 point something, 9.13. Uh, and come back down a little bit, but 8.9% still pretty pretty high in, uh, compared to the recent low. Tarrant County information. So our trends are not slowing down. Uh, we, we took a little dip uh, on the hospitalizations over the last week, but I think over the weekend the uh, information firmed up again. Um, you know, I think on Monday we had 487 people in the hospital. And a point of clarification, just a reminder, we are a metro county, so we do get patients from other counties. So at the hospital level, that data is not you know, differentiated. They just report who's in the hospital with COVID-19, so that's what we get. Uh, but at the case reporting level, we do a lot of work to figure out who's Tarrant County and who's not. I know you all get uh, information from me every morning, and by the time we post it on the dashboard, the numbers float down a little because we clean up and find out who's out of county and who's not. 
Um, so when we post on the dashboard, it's pretty close to accurate. And um, so our you know hospitalization rate is at 10% of available bed capacity in Tarrant County. Case trends, and this time around I presented to you two charts. Um, the left chart you're more familiar with because I show it every week. That's how we show the outbreak uh, representation on a, uh, on a specimen collection date. The idea is that's very close to when somebody got sick. Usually, you know, a couple, three days later, people go get tested. Uh, so it, it gives you a more smoother look on actually how the disease is progressing in the community. As you can see, clear uptrend, we're surging. Um, it's different than what we saw back in end of June. The surge was very rapid. Uh, within about three to four weeks, we reached a peak. So now we're surging in a more orderly fashion if there's one, but uh, we've got about six to seven weeks that have gone in and every week we're adding more and more cases. On the right, I wanted to highlight something different. This is what you all hear every morning and, and the media reports every day because we report the numbers. So it's by report date. So we have actually hit a peak based on that. Um, you know, the last peak we saw was the week of 4th of July, the week ending 11th of July, which was a Saturday. And we had about 4,100 some cases. This last week, uh, the week ending Saturday, we already have 45, close to 4,600 cases. So on a report basis, we peaked. But if you look at the chart on the left, and that's why I keep uh, looking at those, it's going to take a little while to fill it in. So, you know, may take a couple of weeks to sh tell us a truer picture. But this does not have any uh, issues with like, you know, data lags being reported or things like that, because that's an issue in our, in our report numbers. I want to point out the bar in August that had the big red bar on top. That was a definition change. And so all the probable cases were brought in. So it, it made it artificially look like there was a peak in August, but there was not. We know and we recorded what happened. So I just kind of wanted to point out the differences. But either way, which you look at it, the trend is confirmed. Uh, we're certainly seeing a lot of cases coming in, and I expect these bars to get higher as more data gets posted. Positivity rate is, again, a, a confirming indicator for us. So we're back at 12% positivity rate. And for the last several weeks, we've been above 10%, which is sort of a, a marker uh, that we look at. Uh, COVID-like illness trend, uh, you know, a little bit of good news. We peaked about a week and a half ago and a small downtrend has developed. So I'm, I'm trying to kind of be a little bit optimistic. Uh, hopefully it will mean that we'll have a less number of cases, maybe a little break. Uh, I don't expect this to go down. Uh, we've seen this before, it kind of comes down and goes back up. Um, but you know, I'll be happy if it goes down. Uh, but currently things like, looks like we're taking a, just a little bit of a breather on the COVID-like illness. And uh, so how do we continue to bend the curve? Uh, one thing is I want to make sure we take flu out of the equation. We have a vaccine available. We know what the flu does. So we should all take our flu shot. That way, you know, it's not a twindemic. Uh, that's a term that media coined, and I think that's very catchy. Um, so we, we want to make sure we avoid a twindemic. And, you catchy know, might not be the right word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. It might not be the right word. Um, but it does stick. Um, so again, if people think that two viruses can't impact us, we can't be that unlucky. Just look at what happened in the summer. We had very bad West Nile data uh, and we still had COVID around. So flu definitely can cause problems. And I know there's a lot of interest in the vaccine and, and that's good because we want to make sure that we really take flu out of the equation this year. And one thing I want to remind that we're heading into Halloween uh, weekend. Uh, so we have guidance out on our website on how to have a safer Halloween. I know we'd like to get back to normal as much as we can, but there are things that we suggest people do differently. Uh, and it goes with, you know, trick-or-treating. You should not have regular style trick-or-treating where you're handing out candy to a group of kids. Uh, our recommended method, and it's, it's uh, you know, well suggested by many public health entities, is individually wrapped candy bags ideally set out on a table, spaced out. That way kids can just walk by, you know, on our system, pick one bag and keep going. And you can still stand at the front porch, look at the costumes and wave hi and say hello to the neighbors, uh, but maintain your distance because that is one of the key things. Wear a mask, maintain your six foot distance. So, and again, for trick or treaters, usually we go as groups of friends, right? You know, a lot of kids, parents walking behind them, you know, you go with neighbors. 
but this year around individual family units. So mom and dad and kids and everybody else maintain a six foot distance. Those are a couple of things. There's a lot more guidance out there on how to have a safe Halloween and people are getting pretty creative. So uh, we're, we're looking for you know, future options on, on what we can do. But again, a reminder, we're in a surge, especially in Tarrant County. Other counties have a little bit different picture. We're in a surge, so we need to be more careful and do Halloween a little bit differently. Enjoy a safe Halloween. And again, avoid large group gatherings. That seems to be an, a continuous issue. Uh, as much as you can, there are certain things that you have to do. You gotta go to work, we understand that. But even at work, try to do things as much as possible, remotely on the phone or on the computer. Uh, that way, you're not always sitting in a large meeting uh, with a bunch of people huddled around a table. Avoid those type of things if you can. And ultimately, keep following public health guidance. Uh, we do put out very good information. And if followed, I mean, the data shows it. If you, if you follow it, the numbers do go down. So that's all I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any yeah, questions? Um, Vinny, thank you for helping to reiterate the distinction between what happened in July, what's happening now. I know we communicated about that over the weekend. Um, going back to the case trend slide <coughs> um, and the image on the right where you talked about um, what happened in August, will you remind me what that definition change was? Yes, ma'am. So um, the DSHS uh, came out that local health departments need to post um, their probable cases. And it, it started off with the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. That's a uh, sort of the entity that helps formulate these surveillance case definitions that we use. And, and I want to be clear. Clinically, you know, a doctor can diagnose a certain way and treat a patient a certain way. But for surveillance purposes, the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists actually comes up with a definition. And a lot of times, you know, they're the, they're the absolute scientists, right? So if you have certain things that meet, okay, a person has these symptoms, here's the test that's positive. If it's recorded this way, we're going to call it a confirmed case. And if not, then a lot of times they come up with other definitions like a probable case. And we use it in many illnesses. Clinically, nothing changes. You still have COVID. But for recording purposes, for surveillance purposes, there are many scenarios that are real life scenarios where you might be considered a probable case. A good example would be a spouse tests positive for COVID. So the whole family is staying home because uh, you know, one person in the family is tested positive for COVID. A couple of days later, the other spouse comes down with a similar illness, you know, flu-like symptoms, you got a fever, you got a cough. Now the question is, do you really take that person and say, okay, go get tested? and confirm that you have COVID? Yes, you can. Or you can call this person a probable case and don't have to go waste a test, especially when testing was in limited supply. Things have changed, but testing was in limited supply when they came up with these definitions. And then of course, new testing technology came out. There was antigen testing that is rapid. Uh, there were several other tests that have come out and a lot of those have to actually prove their metal before they can move on to be a confirmatory test. Um, so currently, a lot of those are being counted as probable cases. Again, clinically, nothing changes. Public health intervention doesn't change. They are still a case of COVID. They still have to stay home. It's just how we document the information. And that's why you're seeing those bars kind of clarifying that. And what had happened was, in the beginning, that definition was not available. So when you had an uh, antigen test or you were a family member that chose not to get tested, we were counting that as a not a case because there was no definition to fit them anywhere. And when this definition became available, DSHS gave us a deadline, I think end of July, that you must start using this and then post those numbers on your dashboard. So we had to bring back all the not a cases and show them as a probable case. So on the right chart, they all showed up on one day. I think we had like 1,500 cases that we brought back. But on the left chart, as you can see, they got distributed to the dates when they got tested or when their symptoms started. So it's more accurately represented about how the disease is spreading on the left chart. Right chart has some reporting related issues, as you've heard, data dumps occur, things occur. Uh, so that's why we kind of rely more on the left chart. Very good, thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions of Hunter? Of Hunter. Of That's Vinny. okay. I, don't, I, can't, I can't tell you all apart with the mass on. Yes, sir. 
Okay, we have some uh, audience participation. GK, do you want me to go ahead and go through those now? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, we have, um, we're going to do the comments first, and so I'll ask uh, Mr. Manius to read these. The first one is Troy Paul. These comments are from Mr. Paul. Mr. Whitley, it has been apparent that you have no intention of rescinding your mask mandate. I suppose we can even expect that you will extend the mandate as long as our governor continues with his mask mandates. Thomas Jefferson said that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. That is why so many keep speaking up about the violation of our liberties through your and the governor's mask mandates. We the people do not expect you to make decisions for our health care, nor do we plan to hold you responsible for the decisions that we make for our own health. I'm asking you to end your mask, your mask mandate as well as the disastrous declaration for Tarrant County. I'm confident you will do neither. So please be honest with us, the citizens of Tarrant County, and say so. We know that you and the commissioners have millions of federal dollars at your disposal during a declared disaster and that you are using this disaster to spend more money. Please don't tell us that it's not about the money. Next is uh, Shannon Paul. This is Mrs. Paul's comments. Peace is possible. Truth at all costs. Martin Luther. Truth. Mr. Tanaja is not a doctor. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree, not a, a doctorate. Integrity in this court would correct that this each and every time it is misspoken, but integrity is silent on this matter. Truth. Integrity has been absent during this pandemic, pandemic from federal <laughs> down to local government. We are tired of being played and lied to. Truth. Loopholes are legal as I am sure Mr. Whitley knows and utilizes them regularly in his accounting firms. Bars open, opening his restaurants should not be chastised for finding a loophole. Truth. Integrity does not cast blame on others for their choices. It owns them. Your mask mandate is not the governor's fault. Truth. Masks cause no harm, more harm than good. Integrity would investigate and Listen to facts, not just those who say what we want to hear. Truth. Integrity would fulfill oaths of office to uphold the Constitution, not trample it. Integrity has vanished. Next is Francisco Latimer. These are Mr. Latimer's comments. The mask mandate adopted by the school district is harming children. Forced masking is affecting kids' physical health negatively, wearing a dirty mask all day, false sense of protection, leading to increased touching of face slash mask. No regard for the long-term effects of prolonged masking in children who are not yet fully developed. Forced masking is also affecting kids' mental health. Lack of visual recognition of peers, adults, nonverbal facial cues, lack of visual identification of facial features and emotions, a forced sense of government control over personal health care decisions. Texas Education Code 37.0023 prohibits any adverse techniques or interventions that, seven, impairs the student's breathing, including 7B, obstructing the student's airway, including placing a bag, cover, or mask over the student's face. 10. Inhibits, reduces, or hinders, hinders the student's ability to communicate. Why does no one care or question that the solution is causing more harm than the problem? And Rebecca Rogers. These are Ms. Rogers' comments. This week, there were two significant COVID reports. The CDC announced that due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the system will suspend data collection for 2021 influenza season. So the spike in cases for COVID will be that of flu cases. We have seen inaccurate and inflamed numbers throughout the entire fabricated agenda. 
On October 21st, it was reported that Florida will investigate all COVID-19 deaths after questions about the integrity of data. This should be done in Texas, but since it appears that our state leader has been bought and paid for by Big Pharma, we can expect that Abbott will not do the right thing. So, with the millions of federal aid that Tarrant County is receiving from the federal government, which ultimately will be placed on the backs of the taxpaying citizens, we are asking Judge Woodley and the Tarrant County Commissioners to hire an impartial third-party investigation firm to inv investigate the accuracy of the following of the following COVID-19 tests, counts, and deaths. Those are all the comments. We have a call, and I'll make that call at this point in time to Mr. James Shelton. Shelton, this is Judge Whitley. Uh, we are at the point on the agenda for audience participation. So um, you have indicated you wish to speak to the court, and so you have three minutes to make any comments you wish to make. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, so I would like to touch on a few topics with my time. Uh, the first being the lack of apparent concern that is shown regarding any non-COVID illness, disease, or death. The mask mandates are detrimental to the physical and mental health of many individuals, but there is little to no effort made to let these people know that there are exemptions in the rules for them. While many places will honor a medical exemption as referenced in the governor's order, there is much confusion with businesses and what legal ramifications they may, might face if they allow people to enter without a mask for any reason. Threatening fines and shuttering of businesses only adds to this confusion and puts the health of already vulnerable people at risk even further. Additionally, on the topic of masks, there has been little communication regarding proper masks, regarding the proper masks to use, proper cleaning techniques to keep yourself safe while wearing the mask throughout the day, and proper washing and disposal techniques for used masks. We have just been mandated to wear something, basically anything, to be in compliance with an order brought about by fear, control, or both. The public should be made aware not only of the dangers of the virus, but of the health risks associated with prolonged mask usage and improper mask usage. Why push these masks on the citizens without full disclosure on the potential harm they are causing to themselves? Another concern is regarding the numbers presented in this court on a weekly basis by the health director. These statistics can be manipulated to fit most any narrative that is desired. The court should instead request that the specific numbers, statistics, and comparisons that they would like to see presented in order to make a fair decision on how long to prolong these shutdown measures that go above and beyond those put in place at a state level. These numbers should be used to designate a clear goal that needs to be reached in order to lift the ridiculous restrictions imposed on individuals, schools, and businesses One in our minute. community. Many have asked what the end goal is with no clear or adequate answers provided. Last, why do we see little to no support for mask mandates and other restrictions in place? Where are the supporters? It seems very questionable that many are opposed, as seen every week in this very court. Many are indifferent and willing to put up with the inconvenience in order to avoid conflict, while very few outside of, of those with clear political bias and agendas are in favor of the strict mandates that are in place. And even less are in support of the restrictions put in place by this court that go above and beyond the state recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. Have a good day. You too. Appreciate it. You bet. Next, uh, Judith Shelton, followed by Jody, followed by Doug Hines. <clears throat>
So again, Judith Shelton, followed by Jody, followed by Doug Hines, followed by Janet Jackson, Sherrod Perry, and Robert Buker. Good morning, Michelle. I would like for you guys to get these pictures so you know what I'm talking about in my speech. <coughs> I would like to explain to you a brief experiment I conducted with the personal masks that are used by myself and my family members. To do this experiment, I swapped the inside of a few of our mass and transfer the material to petri dishes, which were then incubated, I'm sorry, <coughs> to see what bacteria will be present. These masks were in various states of use. One kept in the car between uses, one kept inside a purse, one kept inside a pocket, and one used by a child. Of the four masks tested, all came back with various forms of bacteria, with the worst being the mask worn by the child. I consulted with my, I mean, with a microbiologist friend to help identify the bacteria that grew from each dish. We found that a few bacteria from the body were present. These bacteria are usually called good bacteria. However, the problem is that some are classified as opportunistic bacteria, meaning that in the right conditions, they can become dangerous and deadly to humans. Example one, skin staph. This bacteria can cause opportunistic infections, including biofilm associated infections, and can often descend, disseminate into the bloodstream. Example two, staph aureus. This bacteria is normally found on human skin, nose, armpit, groin, and other areas. Under the right circumstances, it can make you very sick. It is the leading cause of skin and soft tissue infections, such as One minute. abscesses, boils, and cellulitis. It can also cause more serious infections, such as pneumonia, bloodstream infections, endocarditis, and bone and joint infections. Example three, bacillus. Some types of this bacteria are harmful to humans and are associated with food poisoning, nausea, and diarrhea. Other types are associated with bacteremia, septicemia, endocarditis, meningitis, and infections of wounds, ears, eyes, respiratory tract, urinary tract, and gastrointestinal tract. Most of the bacteria are spread by touching infected blood or bodily fluids, most often by contaminated hands. The bacteria are also spread by having direct contact with an infected person, by using a contaminated object, or by inhaling infected droplets dispersed by sneezing or coughing. Thank you, Ms. Shelton. Have a Thank good day. you. Jody, followed by Doug Hines, followed by Janet Jackson. I'm going to start by saying October, as some people, maybe they don't know, but is um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So it's very unsettling to know that the collateral damage caused by your order and the governor's and everybody else's order has <coughs> caused murders, especially in this county. Um, on October 6th, a man was arrested in Fort Worth for the murder of his estranged girlfriend and setting the house on fire. 
October 16th, a man shot his girlfriend to death and her body was found in the front yard. October 19th, a man was arrested for shooting his wife in front of their three children. When you see parents being killed in front of their children, it's bad enough they're going to lose the parent for life. They will be traumatized indefinitely. During this so-called COVID pandemic, domestic violence has surged across the nation. Just between the months of March and May, over 6,200 victims cited it was because of COVID. Um, victims' advocates say abusers are using COVID as a reason to isolate their victims as well. The family place had 10 victims just come to their facility in one night. 10 victims. Those were the lucky ones that were not murdered. Um, the collateral damage of this unlawful order has been immense and exponential. The division has also been immense, masked versus, uh, versus unmasked. The unmasked are treated poorly and told we have no morals. We're treated poorly even here. Many of us have doctor's orders to never wear a face covering. As if we haven't been through enough, we now hear that some of you wish to segregate us at the voting places as if we are carrying some grave disease, and several of you wish to impose citations on us. Even though these orders have caused many of us to lose and have zero funds to even buy groceries or pay our bills. Individuals that cannot wear a mask are being discriminated against and have lost jobs, cannot seek medical, mental health, or dental care even, One and minute. we cannot shop freely for necessities without being harassed. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to skip to something else. We've also lost our trust in government. We've lost our trust in the public health authority due the, to these tyrannical measures of quarantine shutdowns, unlawful mask orders, and we know full well that these are emolument violations committed by those that stand to make a profit off the willful, intentional violations of rights and freedoms of flesh and blood men and women. There's many school-aged children forced to be separated from their friends and harmed by the mass. According to LEAD, which is Law Enforcement Against Drugs, there has been a 600% increase in cyberbullying now due to online schooling. I would really hate to be in all your shoes, causing collateral damage for something that is man-made or made up to cause fear to incite the naive into taking a harmful vaccine in the future or a test just to receive funding is not an excuse. Each of you have an important decision to make. Do you wish to be on the right side of history and stop with the democide and genocide? Or are you content knowing you will one day be standing before God trying to explain away your crimes against humanity? Thank you, Jody. Doug Hines. Sharon, would you like to come forward now and then uh, when Doug gets in, he can be the, the next one? Yes, Come on forward. Well, there he is. Be prepared next time. <laughs> Doug is followed by Janet, followed by Sherrod, followed by Robert. Judge Whitley, commissioners, thanks for having us back again today. Uh, I just want to follow up a little bit on my comments from last week, but I'm going to start off by saying thank God Justice Barrett is now a sitting member of the U.S. Supreme Court and is joining Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and other three, the other three constitutionally-minded Supreme Court justices because one way or the other, the executive tyranny of unconstitutional COVID restrictions in Texas and across the nation will be reviewed by the Supreme Court, and it will happen. And when it does, our first, fifth, and 14th Amendments will be restored to we the people. This dark winter of unconstitutional tyr tyranny will be over, and the people will be set free from the mass COVID psychosis gripping the entire country at this moment and for the past eight months. As the Texas Supreme Court stated in Enray Salon Alamode et al., decision of May 5th, all government power in this country, no matter how well-intentioned, derives only from the state and federal constitutions. Government power cannot be exercised in conflict with these constitutions, even in a pandemic. If we tolerate unconstitutional government orders during an emergency, whether out of expediency or fear, we abandon the Constitution at the moment we need it most. Any government that has made the grave decision to suspend liberties of free people during an emergency, health emergency, should welcome the opportunity to demonstrate to its citizens and to the court 
that its chosen measures are absolutely necessary to combat a threat of overwhelming severity. The government should also be expected to demonstrate that less restrictive measures cannot adequately address the threat. Then the court went on to say, as more, this is in May 5th, as more becomes known about the threat and about the less restrictive, more targeted ways to respond to it, continued burdens on constitutional liberties may not survive judicial scrutiny. In other words, constitutional liberties and freedoms cannot be suspended legislatively or executively unless demonstrably absolutely necessary. In the Texas Disaster Act of 1975, upon which this tyranny is based, the legislature charged the governor with the responsibility for meeting the danger to the state and people presented by disasters for under 418.11. And again, that's the, that's the predicate here. But as the court said, in In Re Salon, a la mode, as more becomes known, you better have a really good reason for doing so. I, see our, I say we are way past the tipping point of understanding the COVID threat for what it actually is. A disease that in Tarrant County has not killed a single person under the age of 24. A disease where 10% of the cases are those 65 years and older and who account for 71% of the deaths and who, and who in 94% of the cases have underlying conditions, i.e. an old age disease. It's also a disease with 99% plus survival rate, which in the eight weeks since Labor Day has claimed about 11 victims a week in Tarrant County out of 2.1 million. Hardly a spam pandemic. The testing may be going up, I say the deaths are flat as a doornail and as flat as this whole thing should be right now, it should be off the boards and out of here. So I urge this court to revoke the declaration of emergency. The, your executive orders issued June 25th and July 31st as extended. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hines. Janet Jackson. Janet Jackson and I'm here today to address the court. Here is a document from the CDC that says there's no significant virus. So I would like to know what exactly you're testing for if there's no significant measurable virus for the CDC. That means you have no quantifiable evidence to prove a virus exists. You're welcome to have that since that's the CDC documents that prove there's no virus exist and they do not have any quantifiable evidence of any virus. Second, their uh, chief science officer from the Pfizer says a second wave faked on false positive COVID tests. The pandemic is over. In a stunning development, a former chief science officer from the pharmaceutical giant Pfizer said there is no science to suggest a second wave should happen. Big Pharma Insider asserts that the false positive results from inherently unreliable tests are being used to manufacture a second wave based on the idea of cases. You are involved in a hoax and I'm lying. Mr. Uh, Dr. Mike Yer Yaden, a former vice president, chief science officer from the Pfizer for 16 years says that half or even almost all of tests for COVID are false positive. Dr. Yaden also argues that the threshold for herd immunity may be much lower than previously thought and may have been reached in many countries already. In an interview uh, last week, and this was dated October 6th, we are basing a government policy, an economic policy, a civil liberties policy in terms of limiting people to six people in a meeting, all based on <coughs> what we may well be completely faked data on the coronavirus. Dr. Yaden went on to say that the pandemic is fundamentally over. The false positive second wave of COVID-19 numbers game, the second wave is based on fake statistics and lying with stats. Of the PCR test, the prevalent COVID test used around the world, the author writes, more than half of the positives are likely false and potentially all of them. The PCR test produces enough false positives results for highly unreliable over a board broad range of real world scenarios. What's worse is that you continue to manufacture this hoax and you continue to go along with it. Our body is the temple of Christ. And when Christ arrived at the temple, he chased out the money changers in, in anger. 
You are using this virus as a money changing opportunity in order to get funds. I would dearly hate to be in your shoes when you stand before God and you have to give an account of the Hands abuse up. of the temple that God created. Sherrod Perry. Like I said, I have two articles here. Um, like I said, I dropped them off at, uh, I dropped two copies off at uh, Commissioner Allen's uh, office and actually dropped off some copies at the Public Health Department as well for, for Mr. Tanasia and for Dr. Colquitt as well. So I don't know if they've seen them. I don't know if, they, if, it's, if it's been delivered to them yet, but apparently you, you, you've got them. So that's great. So I want to talk about, I want to kind of pull a few quotes from it. Uh, again, like I said, more and more doctors uh, worldwide are speaking out against the mask. And it's speaking out against the, you know, the lockdowns and the shutdowns. So I want to pull some quotes from one of my articles here. Um, so this is from a, a neurologist in Germany. Uh, essentially, she says that masks do cause oxygen deprivation and permanent neurological damage, uh, especially in the developing brains of children. So, like I said, um, and one point she makes is, um, when you have chronic oxygen deprivation, all of these symptoms that you're going to get as, as headaches, you know, drowsiness, sh you know, dizziness, concentration issues, you'll have those, you'll have those symptoms initially, uh, but over time they disappear. Um, but the point she's making, though, even though those symptoms have disappeared, you're, getting a, you're still getting an undersupply of oxygen, and that is going to progress and it's going to damage your brain slowly over time. And her quote, while you're thinking that you've gotten used to wearing your mask and rebreathing your own exhaled air, the de degenerative processes in your brain are getting amplified as your oxygen deprivation continues. For children and adolescents, masks are an absolute no-no. Children and adolescents have an extremely active and adaptive immune system, and they need a constant interaction with the microbiome of the earth. In other words, they need to be exposed to germs. That's what their immune system is created to do. Uh, their brain is also incredibly active. Uh, it has a lot to learn. The child's brain is thirsting for oxygen. The more metabolically active that organ is, the more oxygen it requires. In children and adolescents, Every organ, every organ is metabolically active. They need oxygen, essentially her point. And the second article, before I run out of time, is called the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, that's the other article I, I, I left with them. And it's basically, uh, it's, a, it's, it's been signed by, by over 10,000 medical professionals and scientists um, worldwide. Uh, it was authored by three, uh, that by three, um, let me see, by three um, scientists. Uh, one is a professor at Harvard. Another one's a professor at Oxford. Another one is at Stanford University. Uh, but essentially, here's their here's the kicker. To I'll just give you this the summation. Um, they recommend they recommend what we call focus protection, which is what we've been saying. Focus protection, which means all those who are higher risk can be can be uh, protected separately, and the vast majority of us. Or should be allowed to, you know, mingle in society without masks and reach herd immunity naturally, not through a not through a vaccine. Okay, naturally, natural herd immunity. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Okay, Mr. Buker, Robert Buker. My name is Robert Buker. And uh, I'm going to start off today with uh, just a, my, a picture of my emails. What you see highlighted here is just a small amount of the 25 to 30 emails that I get from Keller Center of Advanced Learning where my son goes. Each one of these highlighted emails is, it says, I wanted to let you know that we have received a report of two positive COVID-19 student cases at Keller High School. 
Due to the issue of confidentiality, we cannot share the, meet, the names of the individuals. Those who have determined to be in close contact with positive cases have been contacted and will be asked to remain home for the next 14 days. Killers are mass Nazis. Like, you don't pull that mask down without them calling you out right there on the spot, but yet they're working. But I get case after email after email of these cases. Apparently it's not working. It's not. Otherwise, our kids will not be getting this in the in the uh, this kind of this kind of a uh, closeness and here I have the governor governor Abbott's GA order and in his GA order let, let's go ahead and let's clear the air on this you do not have to have a mask to go to the polling station period let's leave that alone so that's one of the exemptions that's in his GA order and um, another issue is that I've noticed is Fox 4 and WFAA continues to call we need to name that doctor. We've already established that in one commissioner's court, so let's move past that. Now, Commissioner Brooks, October 13, 2020, you stated the science ought to control our directions with this pandemic and upticks. Are we in the bet your freedoms and liberties on that? If you say yes, continue to vote yes on the mandate and the EDD. Science has failed us time and time again, the CDC and the WHO and the vaccines. Also, Commissioner Brooks and Commissioner Allen, you led the way against the fight against the ICE proposal a while back. With that being said, you cannot pick and choose the rights, freedoms, and liberties that you're willing to fight for adopted by the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. One minute. Mr. Whitley, your bio it says that you are a sustainable communities, efficient government, support for veterans and military families, as well as youth, youth and children's issues. 30% increase in suicide rates as we still keep going with this. I have was reported by WFA Tarrant County Health Director gives advice on handling COVID-19 after Frisco Mantis problem presumptively. This was just earlier this month. Volunteer in AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine trial dies in Brazil, but yeah, vaccines are safe. COVID-19 trial participant had serious neurological symptoms, but could be discharged today. That was in September. Here we have more congregating no mask. Lovely Arlington mayor and our wonder, wonderful governor, no mask at the Globe Life Stadium. More than one. Betsy Price. Thank you, Mr. Buker. Continue to slap y'all in the face. I don't know when y'all are going to realize this is a plan. That concludes our uh, public comments for today. Mr. Manius. Your Honor, members of court, um, we are not going to have a presentation by Guidehouse today. They uh, they provided a report to us. It's in your folders and on the electronic court book. Um, the only major thing that has changed as it relates to that report and it's something that we continue to work on is the issue dealing with FEMA because of, of the uh, different direction that we're getting and the rejection of some of our uh, claims to FEMA. We're trying to re revise what our projections are going to be so we can give you a more accurate number and expect to do that within the next week or two. I would like to report, though, that uh, on our weekly activity reports that uh, we have some very good news. First of all, you know, one of the first things that we report on <laughs> is the Small Business Grant Assistance Program. Well, we opened up the portal yesterday at 10 o'clock. And at the close of business uh, yesterday afternoon, we had already received 380 applications. We have 291 of those are in in progress. In other words, they've they made the they've opened up the the application itself. There's st people are still working on theirs. Uh, they have have 68 have been finalized and are now up and moving to a point where they're going to begin the review. And 21 have already been assigned for review. Uh, we provided additional staffing uh, for uh, the county auditor's office to make sure that we can expedite those applications and um, it looks like uh, we're off to a good start so that's that's 
good news. Our testing, we once again have tested a significant number of people over the last week, actually in our sites, which include the Arlington test site, the uh, North Richmond Hills H2O site, uh, our TCC South Campus site, and the roving sites that we, in conjunction with the City of Fort Worth, are conducting. Last week, we tested 9,062. <coughs> so those numbers are going up, and, and obviously that's a good sign. Um, <clears throat> on our rental assistance, you probably we've reached out to several of you. We are beginning a massive campaign on increasing uh, the uh, the variety or the, the notice that we are in seeking additional rental assistance. I don't know if you saw the Star Telegram this morning. There was a very large article that talked about both um, uh, the rental assistance program and the small business grant assistance program. Uh, we're also going to be doing um, some some spots on 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 uh, social media and and also on radio. So we believe that those numbers are going to increase also. As of um, yesterday, we had um, we had 1,404 applications which we've received. We've approved 805 for a total of uh, 2.96 million dollars. We have 566 that we're reviewing now. In order to expedite that process even more, we have um, <coughs> we have added a significant amount of additional resources to our office and to community development to process those applications and um, and so we believe that you're going to see that number increase rapidly and then finally on the uh, non-governmental assistance program uh, we did uh, I think six grants today so that's in addition to the 6.8 million dollars that we've released so far uh, we're still working with nonprofits on a one-on-one -on -one basis so that whenever they apply, that, um, that we can expedite their applications. And then finally, once again, we are working with um, on the our municipal or our, our governmental partners. We're working aggressively with both MHMR and the 911 district. And uh, I think we're in contract position now. We're moving very closely to bringing those to the commissioner's court. Those are going to be multi-million dollar requests from the court. <coughs> and so. Um, and so that's the status of where we are now. We're, I will tell you that your staff, county staff, auditor staff, we're working very hard to make sure that these programs are successful. Thank you very much. Thank Is you. that it? Yes, sir. Then we'll recess our open meeting to proceed mm -hmm. to close to discuss items exempted. tell you that I think we need we need four times as opposed to three times. And we don't have JD and JD and Devin if y'all are on say something. She's trying to get them on there. But Roy's fixing to have to leave, and he's and we need this quorum while we got it. So let's go ahead and start. That way we have a okay. quorum. Having returned from our closed session, we'll now address the following matters. So if we can go to the administrator's office, we're requesting that the commissioner's court make the following motion, or approve the following motion. We're requesting that the commissioner's court approve the authorize a county administrator to to provide um, additional payments between not less than two percent or two times nor more than four times the current rate for temporary employees uh, provided by that are providing election services and to create a list which we will provide to uh, uh, the commissioner's court for final approval and also to the auditor move approval Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, Devin, what we've just asked or what we've just made a motion to is to allow uh, the administrator flexibility for paying our uh, temporary workers 
um, election. election workers, um, not more than, not less than two times nor more than four times. And this is in an effort to, um, you know, compensate them for the extra work and everything that they're going to be doing over the last week um, with regards to the, you know, and then all the stuff that's going around with COVID. We are a little concerned. We've lost five locations uh, and workers in those locations already. Uh, and we're concerned that some folks may just say, you know, for $10 an hour or whatever, it's not worth us running that risk. And so we want to have some flexibility there. Um, certainly. So just to make sure that I understand, it's for all temporary election workers, right? Regardless of whatever function that they're serving? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be great. I received calls from some workers over the past week with concern. So I think hopefully that would help in our retention efforts. And um, to... Okay. What's that? Yeah, the contractors, this is for the county. Cornerstone will take, we'll, we'll work with Cornerstone on the other. Um, no other discussion, please vote. Commissioner Allen? Yes. Commissioner Johnson, are you on? Motion passes 4-0. Thank you. There being no further business, we're adjourned. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.